Please turn with me in God's Word this morning to the book of Colossians. Colossians chapter 3, and we take up again our, our reading and our study of this, this little book of God's Word. We come this morning to, uh, to look at Colossians 3, 18 and 19, a relationship in which our, our Christian faith is to be exhibited and to be seen. Being a Christian is to impact upon three relationships that, that Paul describes in the coming verses, uh, that, that being a Christian impacts, firstly, marriage, then the family, then in our, in our workplace. We're going to look at these over the, the coming weeks this, this morning, thinking particularly in marriage, how being a Christian impacts uh, upon us as husbands and wives. And we're going to see, as Paul says here in verses 18 and 19, it means submission and it means love. And, and I know, I, I appreciate there are people in, in our congregation who aren't married and may think, well, I can, I can switch off. Uh, this doesn't apply to me. But submission and, and love are, are attributes that, that God wants us to show not only in the marriage relationship, but submission to, to him, love to him, submission to those in authority over us. Uh, uh, love to those in authority over us, uh, love to, to his people, love to, to your enemies. So uh, in our study today, please, you know, if you're, you're not married, don't, don't switch off. Don't think this doesn't apply. The wider principles of, of submission and love, as, as we see here, they, they, they apply to, uh, to us all. So turn with me, please, to Colossians chapter 3, and we will read from verses 12 through to the, the beginning of, of chapter 4. Colossians chapter 3, we read from verse 12 through to the first verse of chapter 4. Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another. And if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body. And be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Fathers, do not provoke your children lest they become discouraged. Bond servants, obey in everything those who are your earthly masters, not by way of eye service as people pleasers, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ. For the wrongdoer will be paid back for the wrong he has done, and there is no partiality. Masters, treat your bond servants justly and fairly, knowing that you also have a master in heaven. We end our reading from Colossians there. Now please turn with me to Ephesians. We read from Ephesians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, just two letters before Colossians. And we read from Ephesians chapter 5, verses 22 to 33. It's page 1194 in the, the Pew Bibles. Ephesians chapter 5, some wonderful correspondence between the book of Ephesians and, and Colossians, written to, to churches very close geographically, themes very, very familiar, very similar. Uh, and after talking here to the Ephesians about what we're to take off and what we're to put on again. Paul speaks about our relationships. And again, the first relationship that he speaks about are wives and husbands. Ephesians chapter 5, we read from verse 
22. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Amen. Again, we end our reading there, the end of this passage, and we ask that God would bless the reading of his word to our hearts and to our souls this morning. Well, please turn with me again to the, the passage that we read from Colossians not very long ago. Colossians chapter 3. Not many words in the two verses that we come to look at today, but great impact, great impact, uh, and so hard to, to live out in our lives as, as Christians. As you know, and, and as I have repeated over these past months, Paul has been writing this letter to the Colossians to, to enforce upon them that there is nothing they need to do other than trust Jesus to be saved. Anything that they've been told they need to do instead of trusting Jesus or as well as trusting Jesus, they don't need to do. It can't save them. Nothing, nothing other than Jesus and faith in Jesus can save them. That's the, the repeated message of the first two chapters of his letter. But from the start of, of chapter three, we have seen how he's changed direction a bit. Now his message is, you don't need to do anything to be saved, but there are plenty of things you need to do because you're saved in response to, to having been saved by God, God saving you. In verses one and, and two of, of chapter three, he has said, Christians, you're to seek the things that are above. You're to set your mind on things that are above. You're to make Christ Jesus the focus of your lives. In verses 5 to 17, he has said, there's, there's things we need to put off, stop doing. And, and in their place, there's things we need to put on, start doing as Christians. We're to put off sin in its place. We're to put on compassion and kindness, humility, meekness, patience, forgiveness, and love. And now at the end of, of chapter 3, from verse 18 in chapter 3 into the first verse of, of chapter 4, Paul tells us that being saved is to have an impact on our relationships. And he describes that impact, what it looks like to be a, a Christian in three particular relationships. Our marriage, our family, and our workplace. And we're going to look at, at each of these three relationships over the, the coming weeks. Today, we're going to look at, at the first of these relationships addressed in verses 18 and, and 19 by Paul, the relationship of marriage. How being a Christian, the effect of being a Christian is to have on our marriages, to, how we're to, to live for Christ as husbands and wives. That's the, the title of our, our sermon this morning is living for Jesus, living like Jesus in our marriage. Next week, it'll be living for Jesus, living like Jesus in our family. The week after that, in our workplace. 
But the first thing that Paul says about the impact of being a Christian is to have on our marriage is directed towards wives. He says, firstly, in verse 18, wives submit to your husbands. That's our first point. Wives submit to your husbands. Now, I can't think of very many statements that produce more raised heckles and objections from our culture than this statement of Paul's in, in verse 18. Wives, submit to your husbands. It's held in contempt by society today, condemned as, as just one more blatant example of the misogyny and sexism of the Bible. It's condemned as outdated. It's culturally irrelevant. It's demeaning to women. It has no place whatsoever in the modern world, we're told. And if any of you today are coming to this passage, this verse, with this mindset, I want you to remember from the outset that this is God's word. God's word to, to, to humanity, who he created, uh, and how he wants humanity to, to live and relate to one another. And having been created by God, it's only by following his design for us as, as creatures that we will experience true wholeness, true completeness, true freedom. I'm sure you've heard the, the illustration of, of the train before, a train being, being designed, created to run on, on train tracks. And that train thought to himself, well, well yeah, it, it's all very well and good being stuck in these train tracks, but I'd, I'd like to go over there. Look, I've, I've never been over there. I'm going just back and forward along these, but I, I, I want to be freer. I want, want to go over there. I want to go where I want rather than where these rails take me. And for a train then to, to decide, ask to be taken off the rails, to, to, to be given freedom to go where he wants, suddenly realizes off the rails, they have no freedom whatsoever. He's trapped. He, he's stuck. It's, it's on the rails where he has true freedom, true completeness, true wholeness. And yet we may think, well, I, I don't want to live as God wants me to live. I want to be free. I want to be whole. I want to find my own way. But like the train who goes off the tracks, we find that, that real freedom is found in, in, in and living as God wants us to live, following the, the commands that, that God has laid down for us to live, his design and his purposes for us. And Paul says here in, in verse 18, clearly and, and simply, he says, wives, Christian wives, submit to your husbands. Being a Christian, a married Christian, a married wife involves submitting to your husband. And we're going to, to look at this by asking three simple questions. Who, what, and why? Firstly, who? Who is to submit? Who is, is to show this submission? Well, it's to be shown by wives. Paul isn't saying women in, in general are to submit to men, that, that women aren't to be in any positions of, of responsibility whatsoever or leadership whatsoever over men in, in society, in, in business, in, in government, that, that those leadership roles in those areas are, are only for men, and the role of women is to be submissive and do as they're told and, and to follow instructions. Ladies, Paul isn't saying that. This submission is to be shown by wives, and it's to be shown to their husbands, not, not all men, not men in general, it's a submission which is to be shown by wives to their own husbands. But notice, Paul doesn't limit this submission to certain types of husband. It's not just Christian husbands. It's not just good, loving, thoughtful husbands. It's not just dishwashing, flower buying husbands who are to be shown this submission. Paul says, wives, Submit to your husband's full stop. He says, if you have a husband, you're to submit to him, Christian or non-Christian, good or bad, thoughtful or thoughtless, you're to submit to him. Secondly, we're going to ask, what? What is, is this submission that Christian wives are to show to their husbands? Well, it... It involves giving your husband the place of authority over you, the place of, of leader, of head, 
of, of decision maker over you. And it involves you acknowledging this as, as God's, his God-given position. We're going to see that in, in a few moments. And it involves you giving him that position, not, not withholding it, not usurping it, not taking it upon yourself. It involves you accepting his decisions, obeying his decisions, submitting to them, not, not just ignoring them, not just going your own way and, and doing your own thing regardless of what your husband asks or, or says. That, in a, in a nutshell, is the submission that Paul calls wives to show. Now, now again, that this, this does not mean that wives don't have a say, that wives aren't allowed to express their opinion, uh, to say to their husbands what they think, what they would like to happen, what they want to happen. It's not that wives aren't allowed to make suggestions. It's not that they're not allowed to point out the, the, the problems with their, their husband's way of thinking or proposing things that, that he hasn't taken into account. That's your, your role as a submissive helper to help your husband in, in his decision making. And, and a good husband will encourage you in that and listen and take into account what you say and suggest. But submission requires you to accept your husband's role as decision maker and the decisions that he makes. And again, just as Paul doesn't limit submission to any type, any particular type of husband, he doesn't limit submission to any particular area or any particular type of decision. It's submission in all areas and every decision. Not just the good ones, the sensible ones, the, the well thought out ones, not just the ones you agree with, you're happy with. It's submission to wrong decisions, silly decisions, poor decisions, ill thought out, stubborn, selfish, unfair decisions. That's a submission that Paul calls on Christian wives to show. Now, in saying that, in saying that, the submission that Christian wives are to show isn't an unqualified submission. When, when their lives, when the safety, their safety, or the, the lives and safety of their children are in danger at the hands of their husband, they're experiencing physical, mental, emotional abuse at the hands of their husband. Those are not things that wives should submit to. Those are situations they're, they're to escape from. And if your husband tells you to do something that is disobedient to God, contrary to God, again, you're not to submit. Scripture is clear that, that our primary allegiance, our primary submission is to God. And, and if your husband tells you to do something that is contrary to God's word, contrary to God's commands, you're not to submit. You're to say no. But if there's nothing sinful about what your husband wants you to do, no matter how silly his decision, no matter how selfish his decision, no matter how hard you find it to submit to him, you're to submit. Who and what? Finally, why? Why are wives to show this submission to their husbands? Well, because it, it is God's design, we see in, in Scripture, in God's Word, that it is, it is God's design for humanity. It is God's design for men and women. It is God's design for marriage. God created men and women, yes, equally, but he created us with different roles to fulfill different roles within marriage. And he has given men the role of leadership and, and headship within marriage. He's given women the role of, of submissive helper, su su supporting, helping, submitting. And, and we see these two different roles in, in the way that, that God created men and women uh, in the opening chapters of his word in, in Genesis chapter 2. Firstly, Adam was created first and, and Eve was created after. They weren't created at the, at the same time simultaneously. And in 1 Timothy chapter 2, Paul points to this order in creation, Adam first and, and Eve second, to, to support his statement that, that leadership authority within the church is, is a position for men only. 
In 1 Timothy 2, verse 13, he says, For Adam was formed first, then Eve. He says there was a purpose in that creative order. And God was showing and created Adam first and, and Eve second that he was creating man for a leadership role to exercise authority. And secondly, Adam was, was created by God from dust. Eve was, was created from Adam. We, we, we saw that in our study of Genesis 2 this time last year. And in 1 Corinthians 11, Paul says that the husband is head of his wife. He has authority over his wife. And again, he justifies that statement in verse 8 by saying, For man wasn't made from woman, but woman from man. He says by creating Eve from Adam, God was showing us that he had created man for an authority position, to exercise authority over his wife. He created Eve to submit to her husband. Eve was made from Adam, not Adam from Eve. And thirdly, in, in Genesis chapter 2, and verse 18, we're told that, that God made Eve for Adam. He made Adam first. He made Eve from Adam. Finally, he made Eve for Adam. He said, I will make a helper for him. And again, in 1 Corinthians 11, this time, verse 9, Paul says that the, the husband is head of his wife because man wasn't created for woman, but woman for man. In how God created Adam and Eve, God was, was showing that he had created man and women with different roles. Man, he created to rule, to, to lead, to exercise headship. Woman, he created to help, to support, and to submit. And last year, we looked at that role of helper and the importance of that role of helper, the dignity in, in the role of helper and, and supporter, how God himself is, is a helper and it shows man's weakness and his need for a helper. God created men and women with two different roles. Now maybe you're thinking, well, that, that's just demeaning to me as a woman. It devalues me uh, as a woman. It, it make, does it not make me inferior as a woman to men? Well, not at all. The Bible is clear. Women, wives are not inferior in any way. There, there's no difference here in value. Simply a, a difference in role. Our, our different role does not diminish our, our fundamental equality, our equal value and worth. And maybe you, you dispute that. And, and, and as you sit here this morning, you're thinking, well, if, if men and women are different, they're fundamentally different. They're created for different roles. And, we can't be equal. It suggests you, it shouts in your mind an, an inequality. You can't accept it that these different roles as is, is, is still maintaining an equality. It, it's, it suggests there's an inequality between men and women in your mind. Friends, that, that is not the case. You do not have to be exactly the same to be equal. That's the, the lie of our modern culture. It's a lie of, of modern feminism that you can only be equal if you're exactly the same. Equality does not mean sameness. Red and blue are different, but they're both equally colors. Hot and cold are different, but they're both equally temperatures. And the different roles that are given to men and women, the role of loving leader that is given to man, the role of submissive helper and supporter that is given to women doesn't mean that we're not equal. The best illustration that I can give of, of this equality, equality and difference, the best illustration that I can give you is God himself. Three persons in the Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, all three entirely equal, equal in power and glory, as the shorter catechism puts it, and, yes, all, and yet all three are different, three different roles. Father, with the position of authority, he sent the Son, he sends oh. the Spirit. 
Son having, having the position of submission to the Father, always doing the Father's will. Holy Spirit submitting to both Father and Son. Three persons, completely different, but entirely equal. And men and women were created to reflect this, this difference, and yet equality within difference. Husband and wife, different roles, entirely equal. That's God's design for humanity. It's God's design for marriage. A design that our sinful nature rejects, that our sinful nature rebels against. A design that, that our, our sinful nature makes it impossible for mankind to follow, making men unable and unwilling to be the loving leaders that we're called to be. And leading women to seek to, to usurp that God-given role of leadership for themselves. And Paul says here, one of the effects of being a Christian is to return to this God-given pattern of marriage. Wives, submit to your husbands. Live for Christ. Live out your relationship with Christ. By submitting to your husband as I ask you to, as he asks you to. I'm going to speak to the the young man, for just just a paragraph of, of, of my address. Men, this is what you've asked. This is what you've asked in proposing to your wives and marrying your wives. This is what you have asked your wives to do for you. And those of you who one day will propose to women, you know, our young boys, this, whenever you propose to, to your girlfriends, make them your fiancés, this is what you're asking your wife to do. To give herself to you in submission, to, to voluntarily submit to you. And that should have an impact on you. It should make you want to be a man that she can submit to willingly and voluntarily. And girls, Rachel and Emma, Damaris and Elizabeth, Mary. This is, what you're, you're, this is what you're agreeing to whenever you say yes to a marriage proposal. That you will submit to your husband. So look for a man with the qualities, godly, Christ-like qualities, who you can willingly submit yourself to, give yourself to in submission. Wives, submit to your husbands. This is what being a Christian, a married Christian woman, looks like in the marriage relationship. That sounds hard. It is hard. Very hard. As I said, our nature rebels against it. But it's not the hardest thing that, that Paul says in these verses. Now, maybe husbands are sitting there in your heart. You're thinking, yes. Yes, wife, you need to submit to me. Yes, you need... It's going to get very uneasy for us as husbands just now. Very uneasy. The second thing that, that Paul says about the impact being a Christian is to have in the marriage relationship, it's directed towards husbands. And his command, secondly, is husbands, love your wives. It's our second point. Husbands, love your wives. Verse 19. Christian husbands are to love their wives. That's the effect of being a Christian is to have on, on men in the marriage relationship. What it looks like to live for Christ and live like Christ in your marriage, loving your wife. You're to exercise your, your leadership in love. And maybe you're thinking, well, that's easy. I'm already doing that. I wouldn't have married my wife if, if I didn't love her. But when Paul says here, husbands, love your wives, the love he's, he's talking about, it isn't the, the affection, it isn't the feeling, it isn't the emotion, it isn't the, the, the warm, cozy inner feeling that, that passes for love in society today that, that our society calls love. The word that, that Paul uses here for love, the, the Greek word that Paul uses is, is agape, 
And it describes a love that is an attitude rather than a feeling. It, it's a, a determined commitment rather than an emotion. It is, is a commitment to treat someone a certain way. And in 1 Corinthians 13, Paul tells us what this loving attitude, what this determined commitment involves, what you're, you're committing yourself to do whenever you commit yourself to love your wife in this way. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 13, he says, love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at, at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things. Love believes all things. Love hopes all things. Love endures all things. Love never ends. That is the loving attitude that God created man to have. Husbands to have towards their wives. To exercise your leadership role with kindness, with patience, without arrogance, not domineering, not being rude, not insisting on, on your own way, considering your wife's interests and concerns, putting them before your own. Bearing all things and enduring all things, enduring your wife's mistakes or shortcomings or faults or sinful behavior with, without anger, without irritation, without resentment, Paul says, but with patience, forgiveness, kindness, love. Doesn't sound so easy now, does it? Yeah, that is the, that is the love. That's what Paul is, is commanding. Christian husbands, how Paul is commanding Christian husbands to behave towards their wives. And Paul goes further. We read how he went further in Ephesians chapter 5. In verse 25, he writes, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loves the church. As Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. Being a Christian, Paul says, involves loving your wife as Christ loved the church, as Christ loves his people. We are to treat our wives, he says, as, as Christ treats his people. We're to show kindness, we're to show patience, we're to show selflessness, we're to, to show forbearance in exactly the same way Christ did. Dawes towards his people. Now, man, just think for one moment of Christ's love for his people. Think of the empathy of that love. The lengths that he went to to understand his people. To enter into his people's situation, their plight. To enter into our experience so that he might help us. In his empathy, to empathize fully with his people, he became one of us. That's how Christian husbands are to love your wives, with this Christ-like empathy. Now, now, don't get me wrong. I have to be clear about this, particularly in this day and age. Husbands, I'm not saying that you have to become your wives to empathize with them. But you need to take steps to get to know them, to draw alongside them, to understand them, to empathize with them in this Christ-like empathy. So getting to know her dreams, her aspirations, her wants and, and her needs. What fills her with joy? What fills her with fear and anxiety? Knowing what she loves and what she hates, knowing her strengths and her, and her weaknesses. What encourages her? What, what depresses her? What, what, what her blemishes and imperfections are? The, the sins that she is susceptible to? The depths, the riches of her faith? Really knowing your wife, what makes your wife the woman that she is? so that you can exercise your leadership over her with this Christ-like empathy. Think of the graciousness of Christ's love. He doesn't love his people because we deserve his love, because we're perfect. 
because we're pure, uh, because we're worthy, because we're faultless. He loves us despite our many, many faults and failings. And again, that's how Christian husbands are, are to love your wives graciously, with all their imperfections, with their faults, seeing their faults, seeing their, their imperfections, even whenever you experience those faults and, and imperfections and feel the effects of them. Paul says you're to love your wife graciously, Christ-like grace. Think of the humility of Christ's love. In his love, he put, he put his people here, didn't he? And he put himself down here. He put his people first, and he put his own interests last. Put his, our interests, our salvation, our needs, well before his well-being and his comfort. Again, that's how Christian husbands are to love your wives, with humility. Whenever you're making decisions, you know, in, in your leadership role, your headship role, not to think only about your own interests, your own concerns, but to, to consider your wife's interests, concerns, needs, likes, wants, loves, and putting her interests here and yours down there. That's what it is to, to love like Christ. Think of the sacrifice of Christ's love. Love that, that, that cost him his life. He gave his life on the cross for his people. That's how Christian husbands are to love their wives and exercise this, this headship sacrificially, daily. Not once in a blue moon, but daily dying to our lives and our wants and our desires and our comfort and our way. Daily laying down your life for your wife. And those are but four of the qualities of, of Christ's love. Think of the fervency, the intensity, the sincerity, the depth, the ardor, the, the faithfulness, the purity the constancy of Christ's love for his people, yet that is how we are to love our wives. And again, Paul doesn't limit this love that Christian husbands are to show to certain types of wife. It's not just to Christian wives. It's not just to good and, and loving and submissive wives that were to show this love. He says, husbands, love your wife. Husbands, love your wife. If, you're a, if you have a wife, any wife of whatever type or kind or sort, you're to love her this way, Christian or non-Christian, loving or, or unloving, difficult or thoughtful, Paul says, you are to love her with a Christ-like love as Christ loved the church. What are you talking about? Not the man, the end of the we spent quite a bit of time thinking about why wives are to submit to their husband and, and God's design for the marriage relationship. We, we did so, I did so, because it, it's hard in, in our culture and our day and age to grasp this and get our heads around it. But what Paul asked, what God demands in verse 18 is not, not the hardest thing that he's asking here. The greatest demand, the greatest command the most difficult command that, that Paul makes here in these verses in verse 19, men love your wives like, like Christ loved his people. And I'm convinced, I've said this before from the pulpit, and, and if, I'm, if I'm continuing my ministry here, I'll say it again. I'm convinced that if husbands were the, the, the husbands that God called us to be, if we showed our wives that this gracious, humble, sacrificial, gracious love that God calls us to show, there wouldn't be a debate about, about the submissiveness of our wives. There wouldn't be any difficulty for our wives to submit to us. Our wives would submit joyfully, happily, gleefully to husbands like this. To, they would see men who they, they could submit to without fear of, of being ignored or walked over or trampled over or mistreated. Men who were a delight, a, a joy, a pleasure to submit to. A privilege even to submit to. 
Men, this is the husband you're to be. I'm to be. This is what a Christian means for you as a husband. And again, I address the young men here in the congregation. If you want to get married, you're thinking about getting married, you know, years down the line. This is the man. This is the man that you're promising to be, boys, when you promise in your wedding, boys, to love your wife. And if you're not prepared to love this way, you're not ready for marriage. Husbands, love your wives. Wives, submit to your husbands. Husbands, love your wives. Finally, we're going to look at the reason that Paul gives for wives and husbands to treat each other this way. And he says very simply, thirdly, he says, because of Jesus. Because of Jesus. That's our third point. Wives, submit to your husbands. Husbands, love your wives. Because of Jesus. And yes, husbands and wives are to treat each other this way because it's God's design for, for humanity and marriage. This is how God created us to interact within the marriage relationship. But Paul reminds us here that Christian husbands and Christian wives are to treat each other this way because of Jesus, what, they've, what we have received and enjoyed through Jesus. Look at verse 18 and 19. Paul writes, Wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. And that little phrase we read, as, as is fitting in the Lord, that doesn't only apply to what Paul writes here about wives. He, it applies equally to husbands. He places it in between what he says about wives and husbands to show that it applies to both. He says, Christian wives submit. He says, Christian husbands love. Why? Because it's fitting in the Lord. Because you've been saved by the Lord, you've been saved through Christ's submission and love. You enjoy the blessings that he's purchased through his submission and love. Your response to that submission and love, your fitting response is to show the submission and love that he commands you to show. To show the submission and love that he has shown for you. To show the submission and love that he commands you to show. And as exemplified for you, he submitted to his father's will whenever he came into this world. The father's will that involved him going to the cross and dying for sin. And having done that for you, Christian wives, Christian ladies, how can you refuse to submit to him, to submit to his design for you, and for his design for the marriage relationship, and submit to the husband, to your husband, as Christ submitted for you? Paul says here, it's, it's nothing more than Jesus deserves for the submission that he put himself through, that he submitted to for your, for, for your sake. It's a fitting response of a Christian wife to who you are and what you have because of Jesus. And husbands, in love, in love he died to self for you. He put himself out, he put himself last, he put himself in harm's way, he put himself on the cross. He died for you in his love for you. And having done that, Paul says, how can you refuse to love him? To love Jesus enough to, to love your wife as he commands you to. He says, it's nothing more than Jesus deserves. It's nothing more than the fitting response to the love that you have received from Jesus. Love your wife. And in refusing to submit, in refusing to love, in effect, we're saying, you know, I don't think very much of Jesus' submission for me. I don't think very much of, of Jesus' love for me. Thanks, yeah, I appreciate it. I acknowledge what you've done for me, but not enough to, to live as you want. 
to follow the example that you've laid down for me. Christian wives, submit. Christian husbands love because of Jesus. What he's done for you. What you are in him. The example he's laid down for you. And the empowering that you have through his spirit. We can't do this on our own. We do it in the empowering of his spirit. And what Paul commanded here to the, the Greeks, the Romans, the Jews in Colossae was profoundly countercultural. Read anything of the history of this era, you'll see that, that women were objects, wives were objects, they were, they were property. Uh, they were, were picked up, disposed of, treated at their husband's will. Their husbands could do with them as they chose. Nothing short of that. Women were treated despicably. And Christian marriages, wives showing this submission, willing submission to their husbands. Husbands loving their wives in this way, showing this gracious, humble, sacrificial, costly love. It was profoundly countercultural in Paul's day. It stuck out a mile. It was a blinding beacon in the culture of Paul's day. And it's profoundly countercultural today as well. You know, in, in a day where marriage is despised, where it's derided as, as outdated and unnecessary, where living together in casual sex is, is the preferred order uh, and is preferred over the commitment of, of marriage, where marriage is ended uh, on the, the, any slight little, little excuse and it's ended just as quickly as, as it's begun, whenever marriage is seen as a bondage rather, rather than a delight, this Christian marriage, where wives willingly submit to, to husbands and, and, and husbands graciously, humbly, sacrificially love their wives, where wives and husbands interact with each other, talk about each other. And this submission and love, it is profoundly countercultural. It stands out a mile from the world around us. And as our marriages stand out, we stick out, they display and they picture to the watching world the submission of Jesus. They picture for the watching world the love of Jesus. They point people. They speak to people about Jesus. Friends, that's what our marriages are designed to be. That's why one of the things that God has designed our marriages to be. To speak to people about Jesus. The submission of Jesus, the love of Jesus, the relationship that we can have with Jesus, the submission and love that makes that relationship possible. May God, through his spirit, the empowering spirit of Jesus, help us to be the Christian husbands and the Christian wives that he calls us to be so that our marriages would be this beacon of light in this world of darkness, pointing people to the submission of Jesus. That we would be examples to the world of the sacrificial, humble, gracious, costly love of Jesus. What a privilege, man. Pointing the watching world to the relationship that sinner, sinful men and women can have with Jesus and the one who makes it possible. What a privilege. May he by his spirit enable us to do so. That through our marriages, the submission and the love displayed in our marriages, that we would point people to Jesus. Amen. Amen.